Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour. I'm Megan Francis, here with one of our monthly Voices episodes, where we bring you thoughtful conversations with voices across the spectrum of motherhood. Before I dive into today's interview, I want to share with you a few statistics. Okay, here's one. The preterm birth rate among Black women is 50% higher than the rate among all other women combined. Here's another one. The rates of pregnancy-related death for Black women over the age of 30 are four to five times higher than their white peers. And another, Black women are 27% more likely to experience severe pregnancy complications than white women. During the pandemic, women of color have experienced mental health conditions at rates two to three times higher than white women. I pulled those stats from the March of Dimes website, by the way, and you can find the links at our show notes. And the March of Dimes goes on to state that these disparities cannot be explained by differences in age or education. According to the latest CDC data, maternal mortality rates among Black women with a completed college education or higher were 1.6 times that of white women with less than a high school diploma. So what is going on? Well, there's a lot to unpack here and certainly more than we can do justice to in an hour-long podcast episode, but I think it's important that the broader community of moms, that's all of us, right? fully recognizes and confronts the inequalities and challenges faced by so many of our fellow moms. So today I'm talking with Monique Dozier, a California-based licensed therapist and founder of Journey to Genesis Mental Health Services. From her work in a variety of hospital and nonprofit settings, Monique has learned a lot about the needs of women and moms starting from the very beginning of the motherhood journey. And at Journey to Genesis, she provides therapy and life coaching services with a specific focus on the unique needs of Black women. Monique has a lot of great insights as a clinician who's worked in both private practices and in hospital ERs. And in today's conversation, she shares what those disparities can often look like for real moms, where they may be stemming from, and how the broader community of moms can help. She also shares some of her favorite things about being a Black woman and mom, which I really loved hearing about. We're going to take a short break. And when we get back, we'll dive into my conversation with therapist Monique Dozier. We'll be right back. We are welcoming back Olive and June as a sponsor today. And Megan, I am not exaggerating when I say that Olive and June converted me from someone who wanted to paint my nails at home regularly to someone who actually does it. I use the Olive and June home Manny system about once a week, and I don't have any of the issues I used to, like brittle chipping nails in between Manny's. Okay, I have to share a little behind the scenes about this. I often do my nails right before we record the podcast because then they're drying while we chat and I end the recording session looking like I just left the nail salon. So right now I'm wearing a fresh coat of Sundance Shimmer from their winter collection. And as someone who's done my own nails for years, I just love the interesting colors that Olive and June comes out with. Yeah, I love the colors too. And I also love the shape of the actual applicator brush so much. I opened a bottle of non-Olive and June polish the other day to do Violet's nails, and I was like, what is this nonsense? The (laughs) Olive and June brush shape just makes it so much easier to get a perfect-looking mani on both hands. Listeners, if you've been hesitant to try doing your nails at home, we want you to try the Olive and June mani system. We like the one that comes with six polishes. It breaks down to just $2 a mani and comes with everything you need to get salon-perfect nails at home with polish that lasts. And we've got a great deal for you. Get 20% off your first Manny system with code the mom hour when you order at oliveandjune.com. Again, that's 20% off your first Manny system when you use code the mom hour at checkout at oliveandjune.com. Sarah, my daily smoothie routine took a bit of a hit in early January, but I'm back at it and I love adding a scoop of athletic greens to each smoothie. It has a mild, slightly sweet flavor, so it doesn't overpower the rest of the smoothie. And I love knowing I'm getting 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens in one yummy drink. I love that you've got this dialed in, Megan. And I will say I've really noticed a difference in my energy levels and overall well-being since I started my daily AG1 routine over a year ago now. I mix mine into a big glass of water first thing every morning, and I love knowing that this simple habit is supporting my gut health, my nervous system, my immune system, and even my energy and focus. 
Athletic Greens uses the best ingredients based on the latest science, and they're constantly improving their product and engaging third-party testing. At less than $3 a day, it's way cheaper than getting all those different supplements yourself and a lot easier. Sourcing high-quality supplements and then making sure you're getting the right amounts of each can be really time-consuming. AG1 is quick and easy, whether you blend it into a smoothie like me or stir it into a glass of water like you, Sarah. And we have a great offer for you. Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash momhour. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash momhour to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hi, Monique. Thank you so much for being on the Mom Hour. Thank you. I'm really honored, truly, to be here. Well, Monique, before we jump into your professional life and the work that you're doing with Journey to Genesis, tell us about your life as a mom. Well, that's that's a loaded question. (laughs) I was going to say, you know, we have all day, so go ahead, just tell us everything about your life as a mom. (laughs) I guess I'm glad you asked me that today and not a few days ago, Um, where I was like chasing the dog down the street in a robe and, you know, after my five-year-old left the front door open. Oh my goodness. Um, I have been there actually more than once. So, (laughs) Oh, I'm I'm glad that I'm not alone. So, you know, um, but I truly love being a mother. I can say that with all sincerity. It's a very full life, um, but it's it's rewarding, but maybe one of the hardest jobs I've ever had, for sure. Um, We have two little girls, and uh, we have Genesis, who is eight, and Journey, who is five. Oh, Um, okay. I was seeing the the name. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see that already. Good. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I love it. Genesis is our, I always say she's my heartbeat. She's, she's a lover in the family. Very sweet. We have multiple animals running around the house because of her. Um, but she just really keeps the house like with such a, just a loving vibe and rhythm. Journey is the joy. She's fun. She's bubbly, full of personality, but a little sneaky at (laughs) times. Um, Mm -hmm. but the two of them together are just the best. My husband and I, we've been together since high school, believe it or not. Um, and it's, it's a really busy life of like drop-offs, pickups, taekwondo, swim, and somehow running a therapeutic private practice in between there. You're just kind of squeezing that in, right? Yeah. I mean, just (laughs) inch it in there, you know, just every so often. In your free time. (laughs) Yeah. But it's fun. I will say that. I I will say the house is always full of life and energy. And that's what I prayed for when I, you know, mm-hmm. wanted to become a mother. So I really do enjoy it, truly. I think that a lot of our listeners will relate to the different personalities and how they jive and sometimes don't. <laughs> and I know as a mom of five, I was always amazed. After I had the first two, I was like, oh, they're so different. So that's like all the different, like that's all the <laughs> kinds of kids there are in the world. And then I had my third, I'm like, oh no, he's totally different. And then I had another one, I'm like, wait, they, they're all different. So it's always so fun to hear those personality differences. Yeah. And it's like, how do you like, it's, I always say mothers are amazing because you literally are, you have to parent each child so different. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have five, God yeah. bless you. That's amazing. Uh, I've always wanted like a big, big family, but I can only imagine you're incredibly busy. And busy. They are getting older. So it's a little bit easier now. Two of them are adults and the, the other ones are pretty self-sufficient. But um, there was a time, wow, when I just, yeah, <laughs> uh, the dog running down the street, sometimes like a kid in diapers running after it and things like that. So that's mm-hmm. like a, a flashback to my um, younger mom life. Well, you mentioned your therapeutic practice. Um, so so tell us a little bit more about your professional background and then mm-hmm. how that led to the work that you currently do. Um, well, I can tell you, it definitely wasn't a linear path. It, mm-hmm. it wasn't a straight shot. Probably a lot of people can relate to that. Um, you know, I actually went to undergrad to become a corporate lawyer. I think a lot of, maybe some of my family and friends may not even know that. Mm-hmm. Um, I just like had this idea in my mind, like when I was a teenager, like I wanted to be powerful, like in a suit and heels and, and like doing something really big and meaningful. Um, And then I took stats and like cried through the entire semester and like barely got a C. And I was like, this may, 
this may be a good time to pivot and, you know, reevaluate, <laughs> reevaluate things. Um, but then I had the amazing opportunity to spend five months studying abroad in Kenya. And I really think that was like the first time in my life where it was just kind of quiet. Um, and it really let me think about how did I want to impact the world and who I wanted to impact rather than the job I wanted. Um, I just think we put so much pressure and especially on women, like, what do you want to do when you grow up? Like, what do you want to be? Rather than like, who do you want to impact? How do you want to change the world? Right. And so I was able to really kind of sit in that while I was studying abroad um, and just kind of explore. I did a lot of volunteering, um, had a lot of homestays, and I really uh, came to like terms with that I love to listen um, and really love to listen for people to be heard, which I think is a very different way of going about listening. Um, I, at that time, did not realize like that was a gift. Um, and now I'm starting to realize um, more and more every day, like the ability to really hear someone in, in, a, in a deeper way than just what they're telling you um, can really change the course of their life. And so I came home, graduated, went to get my master's at School of Social Work at USC, and then just really like jumped in um, into therapy full time. I still was trying to figure out like what I wanted to do though with therapy. And I did a little bit of everything. And when I say everything, like everything, I was a child therapist. I worked with vets. Um, I worked with military coming home with traumatic brain injury. Um, I worked with seniors who were like homebound, like every, every, I, I just wanted to explore and really figure out like, where is my niche? Um, and then I really fell in love with hospital social work. Um, and so that's partly what I do now. I do crisis intervention and grief and loss um, work in a hospital setting, specifically in the ER. But then, you know, after the pandemic hit, things just kind of shifted, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. But that's when I started my private practice at the top of the pandemic um, kind of hitting and um, jumped in to really kind of focus work on providing mental health services to black women, um, you know, with kind of going to and through their journey to motherhood. I just really wanted um, to kind of give them a place to be able to come and not have to do any type of like code switching or explaining themselves. Um, and also really wanted to kind of be a solution to a big problem with access to, to care for them. Um, the practice name, as you can see, is, with, is, is um, for my daughters, you know, just to honor them. But then also kind of like a play on words where so many times in life, women are going on multiple journeys that lead to a new genesis in their life. And I think it's that journey that makes it very, um, we kind of have fears during that path, right? Like it's very daunting, like how are we going to get there? Um, what's going to be on the other side? And so I really just kind of want them to be a guide for them so that they can get to that place with a little bit more clarity and confidence. Um, and so that's why I kind of created the practice. I, I really wanted to offer more hope and during a time where there was a lot of worry and fear. Yeah. Wow. And, and the decision to um, focus primarily on the experiences of black women, I know I'm sure mm -hmm. came in large part from your from your personal experiences, you mentioned code switching. And I think this is a great opportunity to explain to listeners who maybe aren't familiar with that term or don't know exactly what that means. Yeah. What does that mean for um, a black woman trying to access care or really in any environment in a mm -hmm. world that, you know, that doesn't necessarily speak her language? What does yeah. that look like? Yeah. Um, it, it can look very different, in, like you said, in, in different settings. So code switching basically is where you feel like you have to tone down um, either who you are authentically, either culturally, um, either as a woman, um, your personality in order to fit in to um, an environment where it's going to be um, digested easier. Right. 
So for some Black women, we see like how we wear our hair has to be different when we go to work or in a corporate setting, which is something I've had to experience quite a bit. Um, well, um, kind of like toning down your personality. Um, so I, what I've also heard is a lot of women will say, oh, you, you speak too loud or you're a little too aggressive or um, you make me feel uncomfortable, right? And so before a lot of Black women and honestly, women of color and maybe even just women in general, we have to almost prepare ourselves of how we're going to interact with someone before we even go into a job that can be, um, you know, very troubling or even um, like difficult to, to navigate. So on top of that, we have to make sure that we're looking a certain way, sounding a certain way, acting a certain way that is acceptable to the majority at hand. Right. Yeah. And I mean, even if it starts to seem easy, it's still sucking up a lot oh. of mental and emotional energy, like in the background running like a computer, right? Like just, yes. Yeah. Like all, all your RAM. day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like your battery is just like depleting throughout the day. I can yeah. remember so many times Megan when I've got in the car after working at the hospital and like pulling my hair tie off. So my curls could like fluff out. Like it literally, it just felt like freedom. Right. And you don't even realize how exhausting that is every day until I didn't have to do it anymore. Right. Like in, in the setting that I have now where I get to like show up as like my authentic self literally every day, which is such a privilege. I just, I perform better, right? Like yeah. it's, I don't have that additional burden that's, that's carried with me. And it's, yeah. it's a beautiful, it's, it's beautiful to be able to work like that. How do you think that those, um, experiences of not being able to be yourself, um, feeling like you have to code switch or maybe just feeling misunderstood. How does that affect black women who are seeking mental health care or maybe other kinds of care on their journey to motherhood yeah. or in through motherhood? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it probably one, one of the ways that I think it shows up just, just without even having a code switch, just walking in the door and looking the way you do, um, and being the person that you are and in the health field, I've seen with my own eyes and even statistically speaking, that pain management is just different. Um, so women who are coming in um, who are either delivering or having any complications with the pregnancy often get a lot less um, pain management or not even offered pain meds. I've seen women come in with like hyperemesis and that's when you like, just can't stop throwing up throughout pregnancy, which is common um, for some women. But when it's really bad, it's very like debilitating, right? Like you can't go to work and throw up all day and still function. Um, and there, there are ways to kind of treat that, right? I mean, there's IVs, there's medications. And I've seen so many Black women come in with that complication or, or problem and be sent home um, and just told like, you know, this, you're pregnant, like kind of push through it. But where I've seen other women um, come in and like be checked in for three days and hooked up to an IV and then they get to go home and, you know, kind of feel, you know, rebooted and, and able to kind of engage in life. And so just that alone, just without even opening your mouth already kind of sets a tone um, for healthcare, but also I think there's just so many systemic issues in health and mental health for Black women. Um, and so when you think of that Black women, you know, have like a three or four times more likely chance of like dying during childbirth or right after, um, their ability to access mental health care is extremely more limited than other communities. Um, you think about... <clears throat> What other stats can I think of even just off top? Um, even when you look at maternal deaths, right? When you look at white women, often they're connected to uh, medical complications. And for black women, they're connected to mental health complications. And so what that tells me is that women are coming in and requesting services, but they're not being provided um, treatment in a way that um, can literally save their lives. 
And so if you come in and you are either not showing that you look sad enough or um, make someone feel uncomfortable or um, present in a way that they, you know, are not comfortable around, quite often you're being sent home with inadequate resources and care that ultimately affects how you, um, you know, navigate life and or raise your family and children. And it, it's like it, it, when you talk through it like that, it seems so evident that mm -hmm. it really starts with that ability to feel comfortable and like yourself in the setting, because if you don't feel like you can be honest or that you're not welcome or that, you know, you know, no one mm -hmm. knows how to deal with you or whatever, um, and it just feels foreign, how are you ever going to open up and be honest enough about what's happening, whether it's a mental health issue or a physical health issue? It's like you're, you're kind of just barred right from the beginning. I agree. You kind of, you, you definitely walk in guarded. Um, and so what I've seen from so many women of color and black women um, is that they don't share as much as um, what's really going on, right? Like they don't go deep when they come in requesting mental health services or even help, even um, healthcare. They'll kind of like skim the surface and kind of just give you enough but never going to in depth. And so they either, like I said, don't get all the care that they need. Um, and then they get sent home or they're told, oh, this is not, um, the severity of this issue doesn't meet emergency or crisis level services. So you can go home and wait for a therapist in six to eight weeks, right? And this woman could be at the height of postpartum depression, but so afraid to say anything because she already assumes that she's not going to be taken serious. Um, and so, uh, and I know we'll probably talk about this, but one of the reasons that I, I continue to stay in mental health and even open the practice specifically focusing on Black women is because when I would walk into the room, I think they just felt a, like a tinge more comfortable to be able to disclose. And then I will also meet them where they were. I will let them know, like, you know, quite often... We come in, we're not taken seriously, but I am here to do that for you. Like, please tell me what's going on. Um, and so that would really just like open the floodgates. And then we realize, you know, a woman has two little kids at home, um, very little help and having, you know, suicidal ideation, whereas we may not have been able to explore that without like culturally competent mental health services. So it's, it's so important for us as a community to really um, come together and realize like this is an issue and figure out like how we can troubleshoot it um, in real time. Because it's it's mental health issues and complications are at an all time high right now. I And while you're, you know, talking about um, the fear of not being taken seriously, I can imagine that on the flip side of that, there would also be the fear that whoever you're telling would be really reactive or take it like mm -hmm. too seriously. I think even for um, uh, white women or women in a more privileged position, like there is a little fear about being too honest because what if they think you're a bad mom? What if they think you can't mm -hmm. handle your kids, whatever it is. So if you're already coming from a situation where you think, Ooh, there's this, you know, negative bias toward me as a mom, it's going to be even harder. I 100% agree with you. Like even taking race out of it, Right. And just looking at mothers in general, um, because I've definitely done rotations and rounds on the postpartum floors. When when I walk into a room and know that a mom is struggling, it's almost she like instantly tries to get herself together before talking to me. Like she'll wipe tears away or, you know, um, kind of sit up a little bit and she can be in like terrible pain. It's this idea and notion that any hospital worker is going to come in, like you said, and think you're not happy. You don't want to raise your child. You're harming them. And then your kid's going to get taken away um, or, you know, just deemed uh, not a good mother, which is daunting for a lot of us. It's just so much pressure in order, so much pressure to kind of be um, perfect as a mom and do things in the correct way. And there is no right way. Right. Yeah. Um, I remember having a friend who had a baby and I called her in the hospital and I was like, oh, my God, you must be so excited, you know, blah, 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 all the little cute pleasantries. And she's like, not really. And I remember being so worried um, 
but then later on told her like how courageous it was to be honest and we eventually realized like she was having some like really early onset postpartum depression and, and anxiety but she was able to get help because she felt that she could be honest with us as friends and we were able to kind of put some help and supports around her but just imagine a stranger walking in and be having to tell that to them, there is so much weight and pressure there. Um, And so mothers in general go unheard and um, really lack so much help after having a child because of that fear and worry. And so by the time they really do come in, we're talking like six, seven weeks of sitting in really bad depression um, and then having to get them out of that while still raising their kid is, is so much more challenging. Um, and so I really wish that there was a way to better assess women after uh, pregnancy, um, especially like those first few weeks where we kind of just send them home and leave them um, to be where I really yeah. wish that we could just provide more help and support um, around them because that's where it really starts to show up. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I really want to circle back on the comment that you made earlier um, about how the experiences you have during your maternity care or early motherhood care really carry forward um, so far through your life and and your parenting life. And, and also, we're going to talk a little bit about your approach and being proactive in your approach and some of the really wonderful things about um, being a Black woman and mother and um, things like that. So I'm excited to dive back in and we will be right back. We are welcoming back Bev Wines as a sponsor today, one of our very favorite companies out there. Bev is a female-founded canned wine brand, creating a voice for women and doing so in a kind and approachable way. I mean, that is right up our alley here at the Mom Hour. Yeah, Sarah, I love this brand and what they stand for. I also loved seeing some of the conversations they were having around dry January and drinking mindfully. Just an all-around great company. Bev Wines are available in six different varietals, and they come in these handy little four-packs. Each can contains about a glass and a half of wine, and each serving has zero sugar and only three carbs and 100 calories. My favorite is the rosé, even in the winter. It's just a little bit fizzy and very dry, not sweet like so many rosés. And we've got a great deal for all of you listening. You're going to get 20% off your first purchase, plus Bev offers free shipping on all orders. We think the best-selling Ladies' Night Variety Pack is the way to go for your first order, because that way you can find the varietal you like best. Go to drinkbev.com slash mom hour or use code mom hour at checkout to get that 20% off deal. That's D-R-I-N-K-B-E-V.com slash mom hour. All right, Sarah, have you ever had a kid who insisted all the time that their shoes were uncomfortable or pinchy? It's kind of the worst because we can't actually see what's going on inside their shoes, right? So we are excited that our sponsor, Kid Soul, is here to make kids' feet more comfortable and mom's lives easier. Oh my gosh, so true, Megan. And Kid Soul has a solution for basically any kind of kid foot situation. Kid Soul's cutting edge insoles, heel cups, and therapy socks can help with painful conditions such as high arches, flat feet, or heel pain that can make shoes really uncomfortable. And they also have a line of daily use and athletic products that can help any kid feel more comfortable in their shoes. So whether your kid has really sensitive soles or just likes ultimate comfort in their footwear situation, Kid Soul is here for you. I didn't realize this, but custom insoles from your podiatrist's office can be really pricey. We're talking $300 or more, and then your kid's feet grow and you're back at square one. We love that Kid Soul strikes a balance between high quality products that are effective and affordable prices. And they offer easy refunds and exchanges, great customer service, and free return shipping. Kid Soul is offering our listeners a super generous 40% discount. Simply visit kidsoul.com slash the mom hour and use the code mom hour 22 when you check out to get that discount. If you have any questions about their products, you can message Kidsoul's friendly customer support and they'll help you find a solution for your needs. Again, it's kidsoul, K I D S O L E dot com slash the mom hour and use code mom hour 22 to get 40% off. Okay, Monique. Well, you mentioned earlier that really that um, experience of care that you get you know, right from fertility, you mentioned um, fertility and and your maternity care, postpartum health. When you, that experience that you have as a new mom, you bring that forward into your life as a mom throughout the whole experience. So 
How does what's happening um, in care, in mental health care, in maternal health care for Black women, how is that affecting the whole trajectory mm -hmm. of their lives? Yeah, um, oof, it's that's such a big question. And even just even just thinking about all the disparities that happen around Black motherhood just gets me teary every time I think about it. And and being in the system and watching it happen and attempting to be an advocate as best I can um, can be extremely overwhelming. But to answer that um, that question, I mean, as lightly and quickly as possible, is, is it affects them drastically. Um, if you even look at before birth, right? So women who are trying to conceive are even going through, are attempting to go through fertility treatment, their access to care um, or even their knowledge about fertility treatment, I'm starting to find out, is a lot more limited than other communities. Um, I'm, I'm pretty open in letting people know that I struggled with fertility and trying to conceive my first child. Um, my husband and I went through three years of fertility. And this is after I was already working in the healthcare system. I had like, you know, what people would say, like, like Cadillac insurance, like mm -hmm. access to everything. Right. And even I have pretty limited knowledge about what you could or could not access with your insurance. Um, but even outside of that, when I would go to appointments or even tell them like, oh my goodness, like, I feel like there's an issue here. I kind of felt a little brushed off by some providers, not by all. I can, can say that. Um, but after, after our first treatment, I had to have a surgery and the, because of my complications stem from endometriosis. Um, so I had to have a surgery. The surgeon comes in and he says, you have stage four endometriosis. You're not going to be able to have a child. Do you want birth control? And like, literally that was it. Like there, there was, there was nothing nice else. Nice to see you too. Uh, I was like, oh, <laughs> that's a lot to take away. Um, right, right. <laughs> there was like no hope, nothing in there, right? Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for like a village of women who were made up of women of color and white women, honestly, um, to kind of help me navigate the healthcare system and like get me into some specialists, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we would have the children that we have today. Yeah. And so um, it, it does really make a big difference. So from trying to conceive, already have a limited access to treatment resources and knowledge there, right? And then you get to, okay, pregnancy and delivery. Um, Black women have three to four times more likely that they're gonna die in childbirth or right after, like we talked about. And, um, so already going into the hospital, there's anxiety, right? Like we've even seen um, in the past few years, some really big celebrities that have had family members die of complications in hospitals um, that could have been preventable. Um, and so it doesn't even always mean about your social economic status or your, even your access to care, but sometimes it really can just be who you are when you show up, right? And, and not being taken serious or, um, like I said, feeling like we can manage more pain. So um, not really adhering to our requests there. And so then we move postpartum and we talked a little bit before about um, Black women succumbing to mental health complications more than others um, in that postpartum time, either because of their inability to be heard and seen appropriately or have the access that they need or being told to wait six to eight weeks after they come in saying that they're having some depression. Um, and so then that just kind of pushes things out, of course, right, to how they're even parenting these children. So if you are going through years of postpartum depression or depression, um, just how you're even showing up for your kids is probably very different than what you would want. Um, and then even how you're educating them on seeking mental health services or health um, care is probably um, a bit jaded, right? Because you don't have any type of like hope in the system at all. 
So it kind of like creates this um, system within like the black community of distrusting healthcare or mental health services. So you have the systemic issues and then now we have like the cultural historical issues underneath there where a lot of folks now just won't even attempt to access healthcare or mental health. Um, and so what I will see often is the, in the ER is that became people's primary way of um, kind of treating themselves. They will only come in when they were in an emergency rather than going for like routine services, which we know can prevent crisis. So it really kind of just sets a tone before even um, conceiving all the way into adulthood for the community. Um, something I think is, is important to discuss is that, you know, someone listening who maybe is a white person in Mm -hmm. the medical field Mm -hmm. might feel like, well, I mean, that's not intentional or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that there's good intentions here. And, and I think it's important to point out that you can have great intentions, but be within a system that, that like, doesn't that you don't know the things you need to know to help everybody or Mm -hmm. the information you're going on isn't the right information for everybody. And you know, like there's all these subtle things happening that Mm -hmm. people aren't aware of. And I think sometimes um, we as white people kind of overlook that and think, well, I I did my best or I didn't intentionally, you know, leave hurt somebody or um, give them less attention or blow them off. And I don't think these things are always happening like on a conscious, intentional mm-hmm. level. And I just think it's important to point that out. Oh, 100% absolutely agree with you. And I'm glad you brought that up too. Because first, let me say, working in the hospital that I work in now and even all the other um, hospital or medical settings, there were so many allies throughout my time working and continue to be Um some of the best care that I've ever received have been from other um, communities of color or white physicians. Um, coworkers that I've worked with have done amazing work sitting hand and standing, um, you know, next to me and, and hand in hand and trying to combat, you know, injustices and, and disparities. And so I agree with you. It is not everyone. And I don't think that everyone is intentionally doing it. I can even say just being in that in that setting that I have unintentionally probably not done as much as I could just because of the tone that has been set, right, um, for so long. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing to combat is start just questioning why we are doing the things that we do rather than just kind of going with the flow. And if it doesn't feel good, then we have to pause, right? Like if we start seeing patterns of people coming in for the same things and maybe being turned away or, um, you know, looking in, I had to start just doing more digging into charts and looking like, wow, this woman has been coming in six, seven times and being turned away where statistically, um, you know, other cultures are, are white women coming in have not been right. And so even trying to pose that information in a way where physicians and clinicians could see it, Um, and realize like they they were unintentionally doing it because of, like I said, the tone that had been set prior to them. And so, um, so many people, even after being educated, were able to kind of switch and and change their behaviors to adjust for that. And so um, it always isn't intentional, but even unintentional um, acts and behaviors can really harm people and and damage people's lives. And so I think if we really just try our best to show up and listen to our gut um, and maybe also not be, not take things as personal when someone is trying to attempt to educate you in a way um, to do things different can make a world of difference. Yeah. I could see how removing the data from the people, you know, that Mm -hmm. were like giving the care and just saying, this is what's happening, like black mm-hmm. and white, uh, no pun intended, but like we can see it right here in the numbers. So now what do we do with that information now that we have it? Because once you know, you can't unknow. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's one of the things I say to my clients all the time in session, um, because I ask them why all the time, like, 
of why do you feel this way or why are you doing these behaviors? And one, some of my clients will say like, what does it matter? I'm doing it, let's correct it. But I'm like, once you know your why, then we get to choose if we want to continue to, you know, engage in that behavior. And I think it's the same for, um, you know, hospital settings or mental health. Like once we see the stats, like once we see what's happening, it's harder for us to see the next woman walk in and not attempt to try a little bit harder, do something different to make sure that she can get the care that she needs. So knowledge is power. I know it sounds so cliche, but it's true. (laughs) It's true. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the pandemic earlier, and I'm wondering um, how you've seen all of these disparities we're talking about playing out. I'm sure they're amplified Mm -hmm. um, through the lens of the pandemic. What what does that look like? Yeah. Um, Again, even just taking race and culture out of it, right? The pandemic increased and heightened people's emotions a thousand times, right? Than what we have been experiencing before. There was just such a more, there was an influx of people coming in for crisis work because of the isolation that they were experiencing at home, which was kind of kicking and revving up their depression and their anxiety. So already the numbers were up and high. We started to see a lot more women come in because typically, right, not every home, women are the ones who are providing a lot of care for the children at home. Um, and women all, and during the pandemic were often the ones who were either having to leave their job, adjust their, their time at work, or quit when kids got sent home, right? If they didn't have child care, um, if they didn't have support systems that could help with the kids. I, I know a lot of women who either, like I said, had to quit or send their kids to their sisters while she worked at home. And then all the kids like did all their schoolwork there. So just the pressure on women during the pandemic was just at an all time high. Yeah. But well, then, and we're still yeah. in it. <laughs> you're it, still in it. You're right. <laughs> yeah. I know I, I keep right. wanting to use the word was and I'm like, oh man, I can't say was yet. Oh, rats. <laughs> you are right. Someone asked me the other day, like, are we in the middle? I'm like, I have no idea. I don't we're, know. We're, we're just in it. We're just in it. <laughs> we're just in. We're yeah. just buckle up. That's all yeah. I can tell yep. you. Um, so it was at a high, right? Like mothers in general were coming in for, for um, treatment and crisis um, support. But then I think where the big shift happened was when the George Floyd incident was televised, at least for the Black community, right? And so not only did I see Black women coming in because of, like I said, the anxiety, the isolation, the lack of finances, right, that was plaguing their homes now, but now they were coming in because of the civil unrest and the worry about their livelihood, right? And so couple that, those two things together with limited access to care. Um, It was just the, the depression and anxiety was deafening when they were coming in. I was seeing so many women come in with suicidal thoughts, um, severe, severe depression, um, really just had lost hope in general, truly. Um, And so the pandemic really changed um, the trajectory of mental health services. The ho- insurance companies and the hospitals were not prepared for so many people to be wanting to even access care at that time, right? So they were not only did they not have a plan in place, but they didn't even have enough clinicians in place to provide the care. Um, and so we already were looking at a three to six wait for people to be seen um, for services. It started to get pushed out to, I mean, seven, eight, nine weeks before a therapist could even see you. Um, And that's when you were coming in saying like you were in debilitating depression and we were still sending you home because there there was just nothing that we technically could do except for crisis intervention in the ER. Um, So the pandemic completely shifted things. Um, And then on top of that, you know, the healthcare workers and mental health workers were going through their own issues at home with their kids being home or having depression or being afraid to come to work. And so it really was kind of like the perfect storm for things to kind of 
crumble and fall apart um, in this field. Oh, so much going on. Um, so much to unpack. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are things, um, the broader community of moms, white moms and moms of color um, in other um, cultures can do to specifically help black moms have better experiences and outcomes. I, I know that's such a hard thing to even think about, like, well, what can I do? I'm just mm-hmm. another mom, right? But there must be a way to kind of create this sisterhood, this community with mm-hmm. where we're all kind of, you know, reaching out to each other. So what are some things we can do? Yeah. Um, I, I think first, like uh, one of the phrases that we say in the hospital all the time is if you see something, say something. Um, and I think that's a lot harder to do than um, just to tell someone because it really does take an act of courage. But there's been so many times that I've seen people intervene um, in a situation that um, seems troubling or um, unjust and really change the trajectory of someone's life after they left um, that that hospital um, or that service. And so I say, if you are in a position of power in any way in your life, right, if you are a supervisor or even a nurse or a therapist, right, that's providing therapy to communities of color, and you see um, something that doesn't feel right or or an injustice happening or someone not um, getting adequate services or being dismissed, it it sometimes can make a difference when you are approaching um, another colleague, either from the same background or community or someone that reveres you or loves or respects you, to be able to tell them like, hey, I think we need to do that different um, than coming from the actual person that's experiencing the injustice, right? And so basically what I'm saying is allyship, right? Like that is the key um, to kind of changing a lot of the systemic issues is really trying to be empathetic and think of like, if this was my mom, if this was my sister, um, if this was you know my niece or daughter, how would I want things handled or what would I want someone to do for me in this situation? Um, And then attempt to just try to help too. Um, I think educating ourselves is really important, really trying to get a better understanding of like the, I mean, the stats that we even talked about today um, and get an understanding of maybe why some of these communities specifically the Black community feel the way they, they do about services um, in order to increase that empathy so that we can have the courage to create change, right? And so I think all of that kind of goes together. Um, I think from a logistics standpoint is trying to figure out ways to kind of shorten that disparity gap um, and for women, like I said, they have to wait six to eight, nine weeks to see a clinician is already troubling. But a lot of folks will say, well, just go see a therapist outside of your insurance. Therapy is expensive. Um, and if you are home taking care of three, four kids or have limited resources, um, paying a therapist, you know, anywhere from 100 to $200 a week, it literally probably is just not even in the cards for you. Right. Um, and so what I've seen um, in while Googling and researching and talking to other clinicians that provide services uh, specifically for communities of color is, is that they have started creating like funds and campaigns where you can like donate sessions for oh, wow. like okay. black women And so when I started my practice, you know, I talked to my team and I was like, we need to do this as well, because some of these um, some of the the campaigns are exceptional, amazing, but often are depleted very quickly. Right. Like they'll get a really big donation and then um, the funds are gone like within a month. And it's amazing that they're able to provide services for so many women But I think, again, if you don't even know about those funds, if you don't know about, you know, um, these resources, it's hard to even, um, you know, access them. And so I'm one of those people. I'm like, if I'm going to talk about it, then I need to be about it as well. And so we also created um, a fund with Journey to Genesis called the Kijiji Fund, which 
Kijiji means village in Swahili. Um, and Swahili is the language that they speak in Kenya. And so again, Kenya was a, a genesis for me and I like to try to bring things back. Um, and so we usually, you know, twice a year put out the campaign to see if anyone wants to donate services and we'll literally in real time donate those funds to um, Black women that want to seek therapy services. And so really just kind of shortening the gap for women that really need some services quickly. Um, and so that's another way. Um, lastly, since we all are moms are, you know, on our way to become mothers or love a child like our own, I think educating kids um, in, in an age appropriate way, right? About um, the differences that different, you know, that people experience in life is important um, to create this kind of legacy of allyship. And I, th I always find it so beautiful when my daughter comes home um, and just talks about the diversity of her friend circle. And so, you know, as a mom as a, of a Black daughter, I'm thinking these friends are going to grow up to be like family to you. And that allyship um, of multiple communities is going to change her life in a way that I don't even think she realizes now as a child. Um, but I think them knowing that she's important to them when someone walks in and looks like her, maybe that they'll advocate for, for that stranger as well, because they'll think of Genesis. Right. And so I think just exposing our kids to more, um, it, like I said, in an age appropriate way, can really kind of change the trajectory of, of our kids and grandkids' lives. You mentioned earlier um, asking questions, asking why. And I think mm -hmm. that in general, that curiosity, um, which is almost like the antidote to being defensive, yeah. you know, like the defensiveness <laughs> that I think right now is, um, and I think when you mentioned the George Floyd situation like what came to my mind was that defensiveness on the mm -hmm. on the side of like so many white people was like okay but that, that wasn't me or I didn't do that mm -hmm. and sometimes I feel like you have to take a big step back and say when people keep telling you what their experience is over and over you can just believe them like you know it's like not that it's, easy <laughs> it's that easy you could just believe them because they keep telling you so mm -hmm. this is not a lie or it's not like a conspiracy to make you believe something that's not true it's just maybe taking, just having the curiosity and um, being open to just listening, I think is huge. Even if you aren't in a position where you have a lot of power, maybe in your workplace or what, or have a lot of money to donate or whatever, it's like all of us can do that. That's amazing. absolutely. And that's where it starts, right? Like just at home, it starts that small and that, that doesn't even seem small to me, but um, I agree. I, I, I don't think that we always have to experience the um, hardships of another person in order to understand or be empathetic in their situation. Um, sometimes just a listening ear, like I was saying before, it literally changes someone's life. Um, just being heard. I've had so many clients come in who are in, in deep depression and they'll just say, just you allowing me to say this out loud has already made me feel better. And so sometimes that's just where people um, really need. They don't even need you to give a solution or recommendation. Like they just want you to sit with them like in it um, and know that they're not alone. And so I agree. Just listening and believing people um, is, is huge. There's a quote where they say um, people are often not, uh, what is it? People are often not pretending to be sad. They're pretending to be well. And when you finally get to someone who is giving you the truth about how they feel in a negative way, we can only imagine how long that they, they've been really sitting on that. So again, just sitting side by side with someone and holding their hand um, can look, save their life some days. Well, we've talked a lot today about um, some of the challenges that are mm -hmm. facing Black moms, but I want to make sure we talk about the the other side. So. I'm hoping that you can share just some of the really uniquely positive and joyful things about the experience of being a black woman, being a black mother mm -hmm. that maybe just doesn't get shared enough. Yeah. 
first, just thank you for letting me hold that space. I, I don't think um, as a Black woman, I get to really talk about the joys of, of being who I am. And so I appreciate you for even giving me the time and space and opportunity, especially on this platform, to be able to do that. So I thank you, Megan, for that. You're um, very welcome. We love that. We love those stories. So yeah, we definitely I really that. appreciate that. Um, there's so many things I love <laughs> about being a Black woman, truly. But a, a few of them, I would say, is first, I really love our ability to kind of like live this communal collective way of life. Um, I call it a village. But um, when I when I even think about my kids, my sisters, my mother, their cousins all function as like maternal figures for them. And that's not frowned upon often in our community. It's usually celebrated. And I, I believe that raising kids is best when done with others. Um, parenting is like a contact sport, right? Like it <laughs> knocks you down often, right? like <laughs> often. Um, and I got to recover from those hits some days. Right? <laughs> but the kids still got to eat. So right, I'm like, right. oh, <laughs> what do we do when mom is recovering <laughs> yeah. and you're so hungry? I, I don't know. <laughs> That's where grandma comes in, right? So yeah. <laughs> I am so grateful for my village. Like truly, my, like again, my sisters, my mom, my friends, they, we really kind of raise our kids together um, and, and this village approach. And so I love that. I love that my kids have, other people outside of their parents where they feel that they can um, discuss some of the most serious matters with, because, you know, always coming to mom or dad is um, not what they envision to be ideal. And, but I still want them to be able to have someone to talk about those yeah. things with. And if it's not me, why not my village? And so I, I don't even personalize it. Like if my daughter comes home from school and has a bad day and wants to talk to my mom and not me, I'm like, Hey, just talk to somebody. Right. 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 And, and often I'm like, hey, talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> right. Right. It's fine. Um, so I really do appreciate that about my culture. Um, I have been really loving to the representation that's been happening in the media for us through like either cartoons or scripted work. And that's been such a big um, change for my kids than what I had maybe growing up. Um, we definitely had a lot of like maybe script, not even a lot, but we definitely had some scripted um, series on TV where I was able to identify with, with the family or, or the person in the show, but they now have like a lot of choice um, to be able to either turn on um, you know, the, the new Michelle Obama show that she has on or um, Ada Twist or uh, La La, like there's so many things that they can turn on and look and say like, oh, she looks like me. Um, I remember even watching, what did we watch recently? Um, I think it was Ada Twist and she has two kind of like curly puff balls in her hair. And my youngest daughter was like, oh, her hair looks like mine. And that, of course, I'm like tearing up and she doesn't get it. But I'm like, you have no idea how now you can look at someone on the screen and say like, oh, that could be me. I could be a scientist, right? Like yeah. I could be the first lady. And so I love the representation that we're having now, um, either in film, cartoons, to the White House, right? Like that has just been an ultimate win um, for us in our community. I've also really loved seeing so many more, so many more Black women step into entrepreneurship in these past, like, probably, I want to say, like, decade, and the mirroring, the, the modeling that that's setting for our girls now, um, and even our sons, to know, like, this is an, an option. Um, it, it's definitely legacy building for so many, but also it just allows them to explore who they want to be rather than who they have to be to provide for their families. Yeah. Um, and so giving them choice and option um, I think for us as adults, as black women and taking that risk and saying, I'm just going to do things different in order to provide for my kids, um, just a different mindset in life is, we know, you know, um, just transformative for them. So 
it's just, it's, it's definitely have been some challenges, right? These years um, in, in the community, but there has been some beautiful wins and at, at the core of us, we, I think we are just a beautiful, creative, hip, stylish culture mm-hmm. of people. And I love waking up who, to who I am every day. It's, it's an honor to, to be a Black woman um, and just raise two little Black girls to, to feel the same way. Well, thanks so much, Monique. Before we wrap up, I definitely mm-hmm. want to talk a little bit more about your practice, Journey to Genesis, and what services you offer. Because I, I think, if I understand correctly, um, you work with um, you work with clients in California, but also outside of California. So, how I does do. that work? Yeah, yeah. So, Journey to Genesis Mental Health Services is a um, psychotherapy practice primarily, and so. With, with that part of it, I provide therapeutic services in the state of California. You can be anywhere in the state of California um, from up north to San Diego, right? Um, because my practice is primarily um, virtual and telehealth. So I am able, just this week, I saw a mom in San Francisco. And then tonight, I have a mom that lives in the Inland Empire. And so I love, love, the internet. I love um, that we are able to connect now in this type of way so that I can really kind of show up for people that maybe um, in proximity wouldn't have access um, to me as a clinician. So I provide therapy services, like I said, primarily for Black women um, on their journeys to and through motherhood. So that can look like trying to conceive, that can look like pregnancy, postpartum depression, even the loss of a child, history of miscarriages. Um, I also provide services for women that don't identify as Black, and I do have quite a bit of uh, folks on my caseload who don't identify um, in that community. I actually have one or two men, too, on my caseload, and they're like, I don't care that that's your specialty. I just really want to work with you. So I always think that's pretty cool when they come um, and want to work together. But I always let them know, this is my specialty. This is the focus that I have, but we still can do some amazing work together. Um, If you live outside of the state of California or even in the state and want to do some type of life coaching, I offer that services, that service as well. And so that just looks a little less, um, uh, I would say less of a treatment plan and more of like goal setting. Um, A lot of my life, coaching clients come and want to work on they've already kind of had some really serious processing work in their life but they kind of want to take things to the next level um so i have a lot of women who come in who like i say either are entrepreneurs and just kind of feel stuck and where they are um and trying to look at life a little bit different uh i have some life coaching clients who really just kind of want to figure out um like connections in their life. Uh, Why can't I get into a routine or why am I having a complication with friendships Um, or why am I having trouble with relationships? And we kind of just look at patterns in their life. Um, And so life coaching can look very similar to therapy um, on some days, but therapy, like I said, is more of a treatment plan. And we're really kind of troubleshooting just usually mental or emotional health issues where life coaching really allows us to go into a, a big, broader way um, um, of thinking about life. So I do have clients in California who does life coaching. But if you are out of the state of California, I cannot provide therapy. Um, so a lot of my clients, I will tell them, you know, get whatever processing work you need done and then we can do life coaching um after so it's it's awesome to be able to speak to someone in philadelphia in the morning and then la at night um and just kind of get a broad range of of what's going on in our nation but those are the services that we offer Um, i do initial consultations and all of that can be booked through my website as well um, and I offer weekly and bi-weekly sessions. It's really great to hear um, you kind of detail how life coaching and therapy are different but can be complementary because I think mm-hmm. sometimes there's a little misunderstanding about that. And we will link um, to your site in the show notes. So if anybody's interested in checking that out, just head to the show notes for this episode and you can click through there. 
Thank you. Well, Monique, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Again, if someone wants to learn more about you, um, they can go to Journey2. That's the digit two, numeral two, journey2genesis.com. Um, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Thanks so much. It's been an honor. Thank you for allowing me to, to come. And thank you to all the listeners. Um, good luck to all the moms out there. I know this is a tough time that we're in, but know that um, you are not alone. Thanks everyone for listening to this episode of the Mom Hour and to Monique Dozier from Journey to Genesis for sharing her perspectives with us. As a reminder, you can learn more about Monique and some of the things we talked about today at the show notes for this episode at themomhour.com. I also want to remind you to check out our sponsor, kidsoul.com, with their line of cutting edge insoles, heel cups, and therapy socks that can keep kids' feet comfy and functional. Kidsoul is offering our listeners a super generous 40% discount. Just visit Kidsoul, that's K-I-D-S-O-L-E dot com slash the mom hour and use code MOMHOUR22 to get that 40% off. Coming up on the podcast, we've got an episode about money saving in the kitchen coming out this Tuesday. We'll talk to you soon. 